Welcome. Today is our Alumni Career Paths Day for field science careers, which are careers that are not necessarily at the bench or housed directly in uh, office or workspace, but are very um, relationship and um, field focused. So out there um, with other labs, other scientists, other healthcare professionals, and really serving as some liaison between a company and the clients with whom you work or the, the users of your products. So we have three alumni here today with us. Um, who have kindly joined us to tell that, to tell us about their careers. So we're joined by Eleanor Zoe Kincaid, who's a regional applications manager at SciTech Biosciences, Andrew Mancini, who's a field application scientist at MaxSite, and Myra Pastor, who is a medical science liaison at Bristol Myers Squibb. Although a few of them have some updates for what um, have what they're doing currently, because there's been some change, recent changes for all of them. So before we have them introduce themselves and tell them about your careers, their careers, and answer some of our questions and yours as well. We want to talk a little bit about what this program is, if this is your first time joining us. And as you might see, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to access this later should you desire. So we bring you programs like this because we want to highlight that all career paths for PhDs are successful ones. There still exists a stigma in academia that an academic career is the only successful one, and we want to change that. So we want to, you to see that all of the things that you can do with a PhD. We also want to highlight that representation matters in science and want to see someone with whom you identify or has some similar or shared experience with you and see what they've done so that you can see that that is a possibility for you as well. And we really want to also help you connect with people that are willing to help you like our three panelists today. So um, this effort is not just a sole effort of OCPD. It is a joint effort between many people um, one of which is Black Excellence in STEM, which is a registered campus organization here at UCSF, as well as Alumni Relations, um, who is the interface between all of our alumni and the university. And this kind of this program came about from another RCO that had um, kind of paused at the beginning of the pandemic, and that was the PhD Alumni Career Series, which was a graduate student-led RCO that would bring alumni in to talk about their career paths. I do wanna highlight a little bit about what um, some of these people are. You'll hear a little bit more about alumni relations and UCSF at Connect at the end, but Jocelyn, who is our um, Diverse Career Paths intern at OCBT is also a member of BSTEM as they mm -hmm. call themselves. Could you give us a little bit about what BSTEM is yeah. and what its mission is? Hi everyone, I am Jocelyn and I'm also a PhD student. Um, I'm a part of, I'm a member of uh, BSTEM or Black Excellence in STEM, which is an organization for Black students and postdocs. So it's space that we created for us to come together, share resources, our experiences, and also have fun. So yeah, you are welcome to check us out on the organization website. You can probably Google Black uh, Excellence in STEM UCSF and find us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jocelyn. And so I do wanna highlight Jocelyn is just one of many people who helped this um, program happen. So they're all highlighted here. You can see their names and beautiful photos. So I wanna thank all of you for making this program possible. Um, we could not, I could not do it alone. And I'm certainly very grateful for all of your assistance and help in making this a, a thing. So with that, oh, I do wanna also highlight that this is not just the only part of the program that we ask all of our panelists for all of these alumni career paths um, sessions, six common questions. And these have now become um, what we call the fundamentals and they're linked with every session on our website. So you can find it here through this QR code as well as the tiny URL from UCSF. So you can see what these questions are. They should, the link should have been shared with you um, prior to your joining today. But if you want to see some of the basics of many career paths, I highly recommend you go on to these websites to see these fundamentals. So with that, I am going to stop share. We're going to jump in to our panel. So I'm going to ask all of our three panelists, and we're going to go and um, we're going to start 
just because Myra's next to me on the our um, on our you know grid here, I'm going to ask Myra to start. And but this is for all three of you, so please tell your career story from when you were in graduate school, focusing on like some of your career decisions and what led you to your current role, which you can talk about today as well. So Myra, we'll start with you, then we'll go to Andrew and then Eleanor. Yeah, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to be in, to be here and and you know share a little bit about uh, my experience. Um, so starting off as a grad student, I ended up doing my PhD in endocrinology and reproductive physiology at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, I ended up I'm my home is the Bay Area, so this was my opportunity to kind of move away and experience a different part of the U.S. and the Midwest was. Um, one opportunity that I ended up uh, opening up because of a fellowship that they ended up, uh, that I ended up applying and I ended up obtaining. Um, so I was there for about six years. Um, I think that it was at that point uh, where I was curious about what career paths are available for PhDs. So my research there uh, concentrated in understanding the non-genomic um, signaling pathway for estrogen to produce nitric oxide, which is a, a, a very strong vasodilator. And this was under the context of um, a hypertension disease in pregnancy, so preeclampsia. Um, so I started off as a biochemist as an undergrad and I wanted to expand the knowledge that I have gained uh, as an undergrad to learn a little bit more about the body. How does the body work? Um, and that was the one opportunity that I ended up opening it up. During my time in, in Madison, I actually ended up leading uh, a graduate student led group that just like at UCSF has right now, and is one of the uh, groups responsible for this kind of panel uh, sessions. Um, I ended up doing the same thing at Madison. Um, so we ended up bringing different PhDs that had different kinds of career path uh, for both our weekly series and also for the research symposiums that we would have each year. Um, I do want to highlight that just because it, it became one of those um, skills that I learned as a grad student, and I ended up using that story as part of um, a way to uh, get my candidacy for the position that I currently have to be a good candidate for that position. So doing things outside the lab was a key for me, and that was one of the first ones that I ended up doing. Um, then I, I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to do after I graduated. So as most people, PhD students are, are told, okay, just do a postdoc and stay in academia. And my PI was very much into that. Um, although the one thing that I did learn from him is um, presentation skills. Um, very, very important for the kind of job that I currently do. Um, I do presentations constantly whenever I'm talking to our customers. And it's not so much about just talking about the data, it's really about connecting with the data in a story. Um, so I ended up getting that kind of training as I was a grad student and continue to use that skill when I came to UCSF for, for my postdoc. Um, the research here at UCSF was still in, in estrogen uh, field, but it was more focused in, in liver disease. Again, I wanted to learn a little bit more about um, organ-specific diseases. Um, and I ended up participating in quite a few programs that the OCPD office puts together. And I think I did everything and anything I could, um, either teach, you know, techniques for teaching. I was an Iraqta fellow, so I had the opportunity to actually uh, be trained to teach effectively and was teaching at San Francisco State for a semester. Again, that is one other way that I was able to hone in the presentation skills and the communication that you have to have with groups. Um, and now I've been at Bristol Myers Squibb for almost two years as an MSL. I am part of a large group. So we had about 28 to 32 MSLs. Um, my territory is specifically for Northern California and I ended up moving away from all the research that I had done before and moved into immunology. So rheumatology is, is the focus that I have I've moved into um, in this last couple of years. Um, and just last note, 
I just accepted a new position with a different company, still within the immunology field, but um, doing an MSL position, um, trying to add on a little bit more of those professional skills as I move on. Thank you, Myra. Andrew. Yeah, so thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Andrew Mancini. I am a field application scientist at MaxSite. Uh, I started my PhD at UCSF in 2014 um, in the BMS program, and I joined the lab of Joe Costello um, in the Department of Neurosurgery. And really from day one, I was completely enamored and focused on being an academic PI. I think like many grad students are when they just enter and begin their PhD. But as you know, the, the years go on, you, know, you go through the ups and downs of research and start exploring what else is out there. Um, and probably around my second or third year, I started thinking, okay, maybe a PI position is not necessarily for me. So let me see what else I can do with a PhD. Because honestly, at that point, I had no clue. I knew the main track where you go, you become a postdoc, then you become a PI, you publish a bunch of papers, and then you retire. And everything outside of that, I was completely clueless about. Thankfully, I, you know, we had the Office of Career and Professional Development at UCSF. I did the MIND program, which was very, very helpful in getting me to explore different career options. And I think unlike most people where they kind of come out of that program and other career explore, exploratory programs with a defined path, I realized I still had no clue what I wanted to do. So I decided that for my next step as after I graduate, I just wanted to maintain as much flexibility as possible from a career standpoint. So I finished up at in the Costello lab. And when looking for next positions, I just interviewed for everything. I applied for positions as a scientist in industry, uh, in the industry postdoc, academic postdoc, science writer, MSL, and got some interviews, interviewed, talked to a lot of people, and from that still could not make up my mind. So after deciding, decided I, I would go and do an industry postdoc to try to get the best of both worlds. So I did my postdoc at Genentech um, and I chose Genentech because it was a large biopharma where I could still do some bench work because I wasn't quite ready to completely step away from the bench, but also get exposed to working with industry scientists and other job functions in more of a biotech environment. Uh, I really enjoyed my postdoc at Genentech, but as the months went on, I realized that I really didn't have the desire to be a traditional bench scientist. And I began doing some more career exploration and really thinking about what mattered to me the most and what I really enjoyed um, during both my PhD and my postdoc time. And I kind of came up that I really enjoyed talking and networking and presenting. So I kind of zoned in more on positions where I could be out talking to a lot of people, learning about a lot of cool science, and in general, um, have a wide exposure to different scientific ideas and scientific concepts. At the time, I had never heard of Maxite, my current company. Um, it just so happened I was doing some networking on LinkedIn, got in touch with some people from my company, ended up finding out they had open positions. After a few months, decided to make the move over and start as a field application scientist at MaxSite. And as an FAS, I'm sure we'll get a bit more into this later, but a lot of my responsibilities are focused on communicating science and um, presenting, networking, and overall um, being the heart of scientific collaborations. So I'll end there um, so we can move on. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Eleanor, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I feel like in comparison that I kind of stumbled to my current job, but I think, I don't know, I think all of us feel that way maybe a little bit. So 
Uh, I did my PhD in UCSF in tuberculosis. I was really passionate about public health, but it was really hard to figure out what to do with a PhD in a underfunded disease. So, um, and I realized I needed to know more about, uh, you know, basic immunology, whether I was going to go into academia or go into industry, I needed to have the basic immunology skills that were going to, um, you know, be more, ap be more broadly applicable. So I did a postdoc in more basic immunology, started out with a uh, a big screen, I was hoping that I was going to find some markers that I could then take um, with me, you know, to start a lab. Uh, the screen was a disaster. Um, I ended up working on a really interesting mouse project, but I realized pretty quickly that it wasn't the kind of project I was going to be able to start a lab with, particularly in the extremely competitive um world as, you know, as the NIH funding was dropping and dropping. Um, and so I started looking around for other things that I could do, started working on teaching of medical students at UMass Medical School where I was, um, you know, just trying to pick up other skills, though I think my uh, postdoc mentor was not very happy with any distraction that I had from the science. Um, but, you know, I was trying to figure out ways that I was going to go into industry. And after I left the postdoc, I did, um, and having decided that I was going to go into industry and living in the Boston area, which along with the Bay Area is one of the major, uh, you know, biotech investment regions in the US. So I felt like I was well situated to, you know, if my first foray into industry didn't work, find something else. I was in an area where I wasn't going to be tied to one job forever. Um, took me a while to find something. I had been trying to network and I just hadn't made enough connections to people at the hiring manager level. I was offered a job at in a flow core at the Whitehead Institute. It had not really been what I was looking for, but I realized that one of the issues that I had was that I didn't really have a niche. Like most postdocs, I was a jack of all trades. And that I had the opportunity to retool myself as a technologist. Um, it was a kind of boring job. It was not my job to help people with their science. It was my job to run the instrument. But it opened up a lot of training opportunities. And when I was ready to leave that position, I had a job offer within three weeks that being a technologist in a niche field was really powerful. And I was able to pick between the job that I started at SciTech of technical application specialist, for whatever reason, that's what we call our field application specialists. But um, yeah, so I was able to start, I was offered that job. I was offered a job in a core facility in industry and offered a job in a core facility in a clinical trial core. And so I had choice of very different options. I was really excited about what SciTech was doing and decided that I was going to try it. And um, I would say my father strongly recommended me to not take a job at a startup. And I was like, I'm in Boston. If it doesn't work, there's plenty of other options for me. Um, and uh, I've been at the job for two years. I was recently promoted to regional manager. Um, I am in line to get all kinds of management training, but I haven't fully gotten it yet. <laughs> so, And they also haven't hired my replacement for the New England region. So I'm currently uh, simultaneously a regional manager and application specialist for the New England area. So it's a lot of hats at the moment. Indeed. Well, thank you all for telling our um, attendees your story. I'm going to start with you, um, Eleanor, and then Myra for this next question. Uh, and that is, can you speak about navigating company or client or spaces in the field, holding the identity that you do hold? And what challenges did you face? Uh, or do you currently face? And, and what can those entering these spaces expect if they pursue careers similar to yours? Uh, well, I guess I would say 
as a you know white woman, I'm privileged in some areas and not privileged in others. But I would say that biomedical science is an area where women are definitely acknowledged as um, you know very smart and very competent. And I think for myself and another number of other women, what sort of derails an academic career is that it's you have to do everything at the same time, sort of like it's it it the the that decision is happening at a difficult time. So I would say the technical applications team and the management at SciTech is more than fifty percent women, and I think it's just something of a more flexible job position, and it's something that people can sort of have done something else for a while and then come back to, which is not the case with academia. Um, I have not had a problem being taken seriously as a technology and scientific expert, despite being a woman. And again, I think that is something about biomedical sciences that, you know, the graduate pool is already 50% women. So I think people are used to the idea of, of a woman having this expertise. So for me, it's been my main issue has been work-life balance. And again, because so much of the management in my company is women, there is more of an acknowledgement of just get the work done. And if you have to leave work at a certain time every day, you can. So. Thank you. Myra. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, it was, I think that, um, in just about any situation, uh, I am not from the U.S., so I am an immigrant. Um, I was born in El Salvador. I came to this country when I was 13. So, you know, you do hear a lot of those stories uh, from different grad students, um, undergrads, postdocs. And that has always been, you know, one of the, the things that I've been focused on whenever I move to a new institution. Um, I think that I precisely have focus in uh, ro doing rotations uh, with PIs who I knew uh, were open and flexible. Um, not so much of just being a woman, but I also had two kids as I was a grad student. And so that focus, um, I make sure that they knew that th there are certain times when I cannot be in the lab at eight, nine, 10 PM and be expected to be back in the lab early morning the next day. Um, and so I ended up precisely focusing on those um, professors who understood that I'm a whole person, not just you know, a lab tech of whatever title you wanna give it. You, we're not there just to do lab work. Um, and I've been uh, fortunate enough that I have encountered quite a lot of uh, mentors throughout my entire career as a student um, and also as a postdoc. Um, one of the uh, things that I, I also maintain very focused as I was looking for a new career um, was that too. Um, and I would say that uh, in, 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 at least in Bristol Myers Squibb, and I've heard from many other companies as well, like Eleanor has just mentioned that there is a uh, support system within each company, um, especially for women who have kids. Um, I came into this space, um, not from an immunology background. And so there was a lot of uh, learning that I had to do, um, learning of the entire role, uh, but my team was super supportive. So in, in my case, I don't think that it really mattered whether I was a woman or a man, whether I was an immigrant or not. It was acknowledged and it was supported. Um, the company has... Um, uh, special groups for employees to join, you know, whether you're African-American, whether you're Latino, whether you're uh, Asian-American, it doesn't really matter. There is a group for the employees to come together and, and push ideas and initiatives that affect them directly. Um, and so the company is, is very open to that and, and is very supportive. So I think that my guard has actually come down um, when I left academia, when it comes to that, I actually felt very, very welcome. Um, they knew I was smart. They knew I had 
uh, the skills to do this job, even though I was new to an MSL role. But I had the support and, and encouragement from my media manager and, and my media team. Excellent. Thank you, both of you. Um, Andrew, I don't want to exclude you. Is there anything you would like to add? I realize that similar to what Eleanor said, as a white man, this may not have the you know the same implications as um, I want all all identities to identify with. But if there's anything you'd like to add, please do. I think I can just touch on one point that Eleanor brought up, which I think is uh, very important for uh, the field science. Uh, career and that's the flexibility. Um, you know, I work at a relatively small company. Uh, we're about 80 people right now, and we have people all across the world, all different backgrounds, different genders, ethnicities, races, and the flexibility of the field scientist position is incredibly helpful for those uh, for uh, for people from different backgrounds because it allows you to create your own schedule as well as be able to adapt to your own situations and circumstances. This I think is a really favorable environment for a broad range of people, broad range of backgrounds. Um, and I can't personally speak to that, but that's something that I've seen while being in the role that um, I think is quite unique compared to other uh, typical tracks that PhD scientists might go down. Thank you. And this next question, and thank you for all, to all of you for um, your perspectives on this. Um, the next question is for all of you, and that is what has been most pivotal in getting you to the position that you have now? And we'll start with, we'll go back in the original order. We'll start with Myra. Yeah, I would say network. Um, once you decide to leave academia, and I had a conversation with many people um, even though I have been curious for so many years prior to leaving academia about all the career path, you know, there was something about, do I really want to leave? Like, do I really want to um, give this up if I put so much time into it, right? The goal was supposed to be, you know, becoming a PI and make a difference in that regard uh, with, you know, the upcoming scientists, at least on my end. Um, and so... But once you make the decision, it was really about networking. I think that I ended up meeting, I, my goodness, I don't know. Um, my LinkedIn profile now, I have over a thousand people that are in my network. And I can tell you most of them are MSLs. Um, a lot of them are people that I have ended up meeting through different fellowships and stuff, and we still are in contact. Um, but the position that I currently have, I there was one person during an interview who was who I had already have reached out to like six months before the position became open. And he and I had a great conversation. He was also a, UC, a UCSF alumni. And so I had connected through using UCSF Connect through all of the MSLs that were in that space. And I have done a lot of informational interviews. So that have, for me has been the key to getting this position. Thanks, Myra. Andrew. Yeah, I would like to echo that networking is such a huge part, I think, for career exploration in general, but for my personal uh, career path, being able to tap into a big network when needed to kind of figure out my next steps. So informational interviews, as well as getting connected directly to hiring managers was very, very important. I was very, I was always really reluctant to get a LinkedIn. I was like, why am I, I'm not going to need this. And then I ended up getting my current job through LinkedIn networking. Um, so don't end, underestimate the tools that are out there. Um, one other thing that I would like to add is also communication and presentation skills were just incredibly important things that I developed during my uh, graduate work and my postdoc, which I mean, the base, really the base of my job is science communication, I would say. Um, and those skills I use every single day. And I think most field scientists and field-based positions um, are in the same boat there, where the communication and presentation skills are worth their weight in gold in this career path. And Eleanor, your turn. 
Although you may, you're frozen on my end, so you may not hear me. There you are. Can you hear us, Eleanor? Uh, yes. Sorry about are. that. I was just going to type in the chat that I lost my connection somehow, but. Well, welcome back. Yes. This time is like the busiest internet time, I think, in Boston. So. Because this East Coast is up and awake, and our West Coast, rather, and <laughs> so are you, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, oh. the question is, um, what was the most pivotal in getting you to the position that you have now? Um, so I definitely don't want to discount networking as an incredibly important skill, I would say in my, and, and activity and investment, um, and LinkedIn, you know, but in my particular case, it was the decision to really become a technologist in flow cytometry. So the time that I spent in the flow core, meant that I had this very specialized expertise. I took a lot of training courses. You know, I was working with a technology every single day. I joined networking groups that were specific to that technology, listservs specific to that technology. And that really helped because particularly for SciTech, for their field applications team, they're really looking for people who are have some very specific skills coming in because it's a new technology and you need to have the skills in the conventional technology or it's too many things, the learning curve is too much, so. Thank you for bringing up like, you know, specialized groups dedicated to your field as technologists, especially, I think as an aside, that's, I think, important for those to know for MSL roles, especially, and certainly in field application scientists, are there dedicated um, professional groups or networking groups for those in your field that you could briefly mention or drop in the link or, or chat in the, or drop a link in the chat rather that you could share with us? or just mentioned verbally too. Uh, I can yeah. chime in on that quickly because uh, ISAC, which is the International Society for the Advancement of mm -hmm. Cytometry is a great group. And this is something I was seriously, this was a something I had not known existed. I was interested in pursuing it. And then the job at SciTech came up and I've been really happy here, but there is a really great program within ISAC to support core staff, uh, shared resource laboratory staff within, um, mostly within academic settings. And so it comes with grants and education and opportunities. So I think if somebody does not necessarily wanna go into industry, there is a whole career path within the shared resource lab world. Excellent, thank you. And Myra and Andrew, if there's any of this that you have in mind, feel free to drop those links in the chat for those who might be interested. Let's see, moving on to our next question, which is also for everybody. And we'll start with Eleanor, um, go reverse again, is that, you know, thinking about your values and what gives your work meaning and how it's changed over time. So can you speak about like, what was important to you? What were your values when you were a student or postdoc? And um, what were what, what which of those values were met after your in your first position after either of those? And what are your values now? How has that changed over time? Okay. Well, I think I went into my PhD with an idea that that was the way that I was going to get a job that was interesting and would use my skills and that, uh, being kind of a nerd would not be a huge disadvantage in that field. So I, I was coming in with a very sort of functional idea of what a PhD would be. And the longer I spent in academia, the more this idea that being um, a tenured professor is the only position in the whole world that's both pure and prestigious, uh, you know, it sort of seeped into uh, my consciousness. It's a very tempting um, idea. Um, but I just felt like I wasn't, I, at a certain point, I felt like I wasn't going to be able to get there. And I had to sort of go back and say, like, 
what is it that I really want, which is to have all of the education that I have invested in for so long be useful and get, honestly, some monetary payment back from all of that investment. Um, I had been very concerned when I heard about the fields that were available with a PhD. The one that came up over and over again was patent lawyer. And that was something that I felt like I would not be comfortable with. Like I have some real questions about the way IP is set up in the US at the moment. So I felt like I didn't know if I could take that job. And I didn't know that technologist was an option at that point. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, Andrew, would you like to chime in on the next? Yeah, I so I think I was kind of also in the same boat as Eleanor in my PhD, where I kind of saw being an academic PI as this, you know, unimpeachable career path where you would be making the most impact as possible um, as a scientist. And I think, you know, what was most important to me, both through my PhD and postdoc, was finding being in a position where I can make an impact. Um, Cause I wanted to get my PhD. I wanted to go in biomedical sciences in order to, you know, therapeutic development, produce life-saving drugs. Um, and at times during my PhD, I felt like I was so far away from that, that I kind of lost the plot. So moving through my you know, doctorate and then postdoc, I was always looking for that position where I could be making more of an impact in the lives of patients and the lives of those inflicted with um, mostly cancer, which is my area of research. And going into my job now, I really picked this position based on the ability to make an impact. A lot of what we do is more on the manufacturing side and process development side with producing cell and gene therapies. And oftentimes now we are kind of the last link before a cell therapy gets made and gets put into patients. So we can actually see the impact of my work and of our company's work every day with our clients that we work with. And that's been kind of the guiding value of my career so far and something that I'm going to keep pursuing. Um, yeah, I think that answers the question. Of course, thank you so much. And Myra, please. Yeah, no, I echo all of what has been shared so far. Um, I think that uh, making an impact in patients' life is definitely something that I, uh, is a driving force from, you know, the moment that I kind of step into the lab, you know, thinking, oh, we're going to find a pathway that we can target and, and this is going to save someone's life because of a disease that we, we, we are making things better. Um, so, you know, yeah, being in the bench is definitely, you know, the first steps. Um, but you are kind of a little bit uh, stepped away from, from seeing the results. Um, and I wanted to continue to make an impact in a different way. So I think that for me, the, the MSR role ended up doing that and also providing um, my curiosity as a scientist. Um, one of my concerns leaving academia was that I wasn't going to continue to learn uh, new things, right? That, you know, it was a, I, I was answering, I wasn't really answering questions about a scientific uh, curiosity that you have. It, it was more of, it was someone else's ideas and, and you were communicating those ideas. Um, but, you know, I was, pres I was surprised. I actually, bec maybe because I ended up moving from, a, from the field that I was in to immunology, that it ended up opening up so many um, opportunities to learn and also the ability to be in the clinic with the physician, having a specific question about one patient um, and having the opportunity that, you know, we might actually have the data that you need to get this patient in this particular treatment, if that's what you think is appropriate for that patient. And so um, it's been a great uh, opportunity being, being an MSL and this is, at least for me, is just the beginning. I mean, there are different levels that you can move up within the medical affair field. Um, 
that you can start not just making a difference in your local area, but also kind of regional, even US or even worldwide type of way. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy with the work that I have been doing. And I'm still very curious now that I'm moving on to a different company, it's gonna be a new field. And again, having that, that curiosity of a researcher. Okay, so what is the data? What is the data telling us? Um, how can we tell the story about this? And, and is it making a difference? Um, it's, it's super exciting. And so I'm, I'm very happy with the decision of moving away from academics, but I'm still in contact with a lot of people at UCSF and Stanford. And so I'm, I'm facilitating uh, communication between companies and institutions that want to answer a scientific question. And so, you know, I'm still kind of in the loop about proposals, uh, about clinical trials, um, about preclinical trials. And so um, I don't feel like I've stepped away too much from, from science. It was just stepping away from the bench um, and supporting the whole field in, in a different way. So it's been, it's, been, it's been a thrill. So I'm really, really enjoying myself. Thank you to all of you. As a follow-up to that, as well, this is also a very kind of uh, intrinsic values, so like kind of the kind of work that you do. But I, let's, I want to also mention like more of the tangible ones. Well, so Eleanor, you had mentioned it at the beginning, like having the importance of your work you know, providing a work-life balance for you. So thinking of that as a value, thinking of where you work. Some of the MSLs, um, FAS jobs are very travel heavy. And so that I would consider that that's a value as well, if you like to do that or not. Income, relationship with your the team and the uh, supervisors. Can you talk a little bit about those things as well and how those were important to you for the jobs that you had, especially as those thinking about entering this career will want to consider them as well. And this is open if anyone would like to chime in. Uh, okay, I can chime in. Um, I would say uh, my job, even before COVID-19, was uh, very heavily work from home. And we, our team uh, is extremely collaborative, the applications team. We're out there solving technical challenges for people, and we're dealing with you know, experimental systems we'd never heard of before, but generally somebody on the team has heard of it. And it's been, I think we've done a really good job of having that camaraderie while also being work from home. My job personally, because I'm in New England, which again is a biotech hub, I actually have fewer overnight travel nights than most of the applications team. Um, and so that has ended up working out well for me um, you know, just in terms of having two small children. Um, and I would say, um, you know, you know, a big value for me has just been like feeling like I'm doing something that's interesting and helping. And there's people who are valuing the work that I'm doing and having management that lets us do our job, like lets us just be, you know, nerds going out there solving problems for people and let some of the other issues that the company is dealing with, like that sales problem, like, you know, field applications can do the things that we have expertise at and sort of, you know, management protecting us from some other parts of the company that if, you know, and a lot of my team members, they jump into sales because they like that world better. But for those of us who don't want to jump into sales, um, you know, we can just do our stuff and they can do their stuff. Thank you so much. Myra, Andrew, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I can add on about kind of the work-life balance um, side of things. You know, I think FAS says you kind of have this idea that you're going to be traveling 70% of the time overnight. And that is definitely true for some positions, but there are positions, especially those, uh, as Eleanor said, based in Boston or based in San Francisco or other big hubs, where travel is actually very limited. And in my position right now, my territory is just the Bay Area. So I don't really do overnight travel, um, even if COVID didn't exist. Everything is within driving distance. Um, so there's a wide variety, I think, for field application sciences positions where 
you have some where you're constantly going all over the world and others where you are kind of more work from home local base and that is what's also nice about the career is that you know from company to company position to position there's a wide variety so you can find a position that's more tailored to what you're really looking for and for me work life balance was a massive component of what I wanted in a career. I felt like many times in grad school as a postdoc, it's just working the weekends away um, and working late into the night. And I definitely wanted something which is a bit more traditional nine to five. And that was when I was evaluating different positions, something that I found with my current company was also important to them and that's something we really shared. And so that you know, has rang true throughout the past year and a half that I've been with the company where it, there's definitely the work-life balance that I'm looking for and something that you might not necessarily expect for a field application scientist. Yeah, I would add um, a little bit to that too. So like I mentioned, I ended up uh, getting a new offer just yesterday. And so I ended up going through the whole process of interviewing with different companies, small companies, 300, all the way to 26,000 employees. Um, so the territory that I currently have is essentially Northern California. So I really didn't have a lot of overnights, you know, even you know, overnights being, okay, going to Fresno, doing your thing down there and then coming back. Um, so it wasn't really, we didn't, I really didn't have a lot of, uh, overnight. This new position that I have, uh, it covers uh, the northwest uh, part. So it would include Northern California, uh, Oregon, and Washington State. So there will be some more traveling. Some of the other positions that I ended up interviewing with um, included five, six, seven different states. Um, and so it really depends on the product that you're supporting. Um, and where in the life cycle that product is. You know, when it comes to drugs, it, you know, the position that I will be coming into is actually pre-launch. So meaning that the team is getting ready to launch this brand new product into the market. So I'm pretty sure that there will be a lot of, um, uh, a lot more traveling for me because of that. Um, and a mixture of traveling and virtual engagements, because not all of the states are open to do in-person meetings uh, at this point. Uh, the Bay Area is. I think in the entire California is, uh, is actually pretty open. Um, the product that I was that I have been supporting with uh, Bristol Myers Squibb has been in the market for like 15 years. So it's very well established. The, the load of the work that you have is, is different. Um, and so, and for me, just like, everyone else in the panel, uh, the balance between your life and, and, and work life, personal life and work life, it, it has been very important from the beginning since I've had kids uh, as I was a student. And so I continue to, do, my kids are a little older, so they're 15 and 19. Um, and so they don't really need me around too much. Um, so, you know, I think, um, if this particular career at this point in my life is actually perfect. Um, so that is one of those values that you kind of have to take into consideration when you're considering a, a career path, if that's what you need to do. Thank you to all of you. So moving on to our next question, and you all have mentioned that, you know, communication skills, presentation skills, or those that you learned while student or postdoc were pretty critical to the job that you have now. So they, I guess the other side is, what did you need to learn when you, uh, that you didn't um, get in graduate school or postdoc? And so why don't we start with you, Myra? Oh, my goodness. I think, so I, you know, I, I would say that broadly, I ended up getting the key skills that I needed to be an MSL. Uh, the wording is different but you're still collaborating, you're still doing presentation, you're still analyzing data, those are key. I think it comes a little bit more on the pace of being in a pharmaceutical company. Um, deadlines are a lot quicker. Things definitely move a lot quicker. Uh, we have a lot of technology that we have to use to do different kinds of reports. 
Um, and I don't think that when I was doing my informational interviews, I really got into that kind of questions. Uh, I didn't even know to ask those questions because I had no clue that that was something uh, that, you know, that, that we have to do in, out in the field. Um, so I think that that's kind of like the major thing. I was surprised of the pace of it. Um, and I guess for my end, I never had an experience outside of academia. So that was, that was the boo <laughs> here, learn it, do it, do it fast. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I think that for being in a customer facing position, you have to have a certain type of personality um, and the ability to flex that personality depending on who you're talking to might have been one of those things that I don't think we even touched when being in grad school or, or being a postdoc. I think at UCSF, you know, that you guys have that leadership uh, uh, training that you do every so often. I think that was one of the, the big clues and uh, uh, big support that I got before moving away from academia of that leadership and, and understanding how to deal with people in a different way and how to uh, manage conflict if, if something like that comes up. Thank you, Myra. Andrew, Eleanor, was there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think um, no, I completely agree with what Myra said, uh, especially the customer facing skills. They're things that you kind of build the basis for in grad school and as a postdoc. But when you get into a position where you're interacting with customers every single day, you really need to quickly develop um, kind of a bedside manner with the customers you're working with. And that was something which initially was quite challenging for me. I always would kind of second guess and triple third guess myself, I guess, um, when interacting with customers, is this the correct thing to say? Am I, you know, blowing this relationship? But then over time, these are things that you build just from experience and then also leaning on others who have more experience. And with my company, we had a great training program really focused on more of these soft skills and interacting with customers. You have to, you know, interacting with difficult customers, interacting with customers who just don't respond to you. And it's, you know, it's, it's a really, I think, unique skill set that's very difficult to build as a PhD student or as a postdoc. And it's really once you get out into the field and you're in the thick of it, that's when you really start to acquire these customer interaction skills, which are so important for a field based career. Uh, yeah, I guess I would add to that that I had this ramp up period of working in a core in academia. And it is, even though I was staff, I, it really is a sort of customer facing relationship where you need to have good lines of communication uh, with that person, or basically they're gonna give you a bad review and sort of undermine the whole process of trust. Uh, I would also say when I was in college and before I started graduate school, I worked in uh, coffee shops, restaurants, catering. So this idea of uh, customer facing, I think customer facing skills are customer facing skills. It's just in this situation, I get to bring more of myself, more of my expertise into the situation. And so that's really, uh, really great. Um, the thing I had the biggest challenge with when I started the job and my manager who had many years managing a core facility, so dealing with some of these same issues, was that people would expect Herculean tasks overnight. They're like, you're the expert. So just you know, just create this thing that's going to be perfect just out of your brain in an hour. And I felt extremely intimidated by that and felt like everyone else on the applications team was able to create, you know, in our case, it was high dimensional immunophenotyping panels, but they were able to just create them magically and that I was never going to catch up. And it took my manager, who again, had a lot of management experience and a shared resource laboratory to say, they can't ask you that. That's not what we're providing. We're providing training. We're providing expertise. We're providing red flag checks, you know, where 
we come in with our expertise and we tweak it and make it work, we're not magically creating things out of nowhere. And so that that's something that I think I had to learn and I watched the junior people on the team really learning of how, how to have those difficult conversations of like, to say in the kindest way possible, like that's impossible. Like that's not how things work in the world. Um, and to just, you know, and so that's a thing that both in restaurants and in academia, I never learned. <laughs> so thank you for that, Eleanor. I definitely identify with that because I worked in retail and grad school and that <laughs> customer interaction definitely <laughs> helped. Um, that's basically my job as well is customer interface. So thank you all for that input. That's great. I think I actually answered the next question too, is what really surprised you the most about working in the non-academic space. So is there anything else that you'd like to add about that? I do feel that like many of your answers were very like, this is what I didn't expect about working outside of the lab or in graduate school or postdoc. So anything else that was a surprise to you? And if not, that's okay too. We can move on to the next. Uh, I have something that being in field, a way that field applications was very different from being in a shared resource laboratory that surprised me, but that has been great actually, is that as an outside expert, as a application specialist, you're not within the hierarchy of academia. And so I felt that being staff in an academic situation was a challenging position in terms of how, where, who you were allowed to tell things to, who you were allowed to say hard truths to. When you are an outside expert and there's a service contract, you, as long as you are kind and empathetic and um, not you know, as, as long as you have a good relationship with a person, you can tell them that is a way that we know is not going to work. And so I want to give you the best possible tools to get this experiment to work. So I can't support you when you're doing that because we know that that's not going to work. And it was something that was much harder to say when I was a uh, staff within an academic institution. I second that. <laughs> well, let's move on to the next question, which is um, based upon like, what is the culture of your current company? One of our goals with programs like this is to help students and postdocs um, identify companies that are inclusive, that are equitable, where they feel like that they will belong. So can you, all three of you, speak a little bit about what your company culture is? So that those who are thinking about similar companies or the ones that you are at, so they are informed. Um, Eleanor, could you start us off? So I have felt really strongly supported at SciTech. I will also say though, that I think that the applications team could be more diverse. I think that the issue that we have had is that we are generally hiring people with PhDs, maybe some postdoc experience, we're really hiring out of academia, and that that is a leaky pipeline where people, it can be such a terrible environment for some people that they're, that where they're not supported in that environment, that they don't, that we don't have a chance to hire them. And that's something that I would like to see us doing is finding people who are coming from non-traditional paths because it is a young company um, to get people in in other ways and uh, do more internal training. And where that's actually something we just moved to is that the position that I had originally been hired into, they now aren't hiring into a position that senior, they're hiring into a more junior position which I think is gonna be really good for getting people with a broader range of life experience. Thank you. Uh, Myra, how about, could you answer that question next? Yeah, so I would say that, um, you know, working for a pretty international corporations, they tend to have 
uh, a very open mind when it comes to the background of, of their employees. Um, I think that one of the concerns that I've always had is, you know, because I have an accent, people are going to kind of have a split second decision whether I'm, I'm good or not as good as someone else without an accent. Um, but there are so many people in my team and worldwide team that have accents that it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Um, and so it's great. I mean, I, every time that I hear someone with an accent, I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I have an accent too. So mm -hmm. let's move on. Let's, let's actually talk about business now. Uh, so it's fun. So it's, it's, it's very supportive. Um, and like I mentioned before, there are uh, groups within the company. Um, anybody could start a group that is supposed to support anything that the employees need and want. And so it is actually quite more diverse than I thought it would be. Um, my current team has people from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, so I have never felt like I'm the only one in the team with the different uh, intersections that I bring to the table. And so very supportive. Um, it doesn't really matter who I reach out to for any particular question. You know, they're more than happy then uh, to set up time to talk about whatever is going on on my end. Um, and so the itself is I, I felt very welcome. The new company, um, I have been able to reach out to people that I know in the company, trying to understand, okay, so what is the culture in that company? And it's more or less the same. Um, you do start seeing that people stay in those companies for a very long time. And so you start questioning, so what is it about this company? And it is because of the values and the respect that they do show to their employees. Um, whether it's the company broadly or even your, your more immediate team members. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling very comfortable, very happy to have, uh, you know, been in, in, in Bristol Myers Square for the time that I have been there and really looking forward to, to the next steps. Andrew, anything? Yeah, I, like I think um, as someone working at a smaller company, um, I think our company, Maxite, does just a great job of really in bringing in people from all different backgrounds. And that includes different ages, different educational backgrounds, genders, race, ethnicities. And really what that has done is create just a really nice and pleasant environment that has led to really high employee retention and I think really high employee happiness where we are you know, spread out over the world. There are, you know, I'm working with people who are 50 years older than me, people who um, only have a bachelor's, only have a high school degree. And you would never know that we all come from such different backgrounds at first glance. And working as part of this team really expands you know, your own personal viewpoints, but I think also leads to a tighter knit company and also a company which is able to achieve its goals better as well. Um, and that was really something that I hadn't, I guess, experienced like really even at UCSF or at Genentech and was such a welcome part of joining a new company. Really from day one, I felt like I immediately fit in with everybody else and felt part of this team um, without needing to, you know, to force my way in. Thank you all. I have one more question, but I will save it um, in case there are questions from the um, those who are attending today would like to ask. So if you have a question for one of our three panelists or for all three, please feel free to unmute yourself. You don't have to unmute your video if you choose. If you choose to um, if you would prefer one of us to ask your question for you, you can send it to uh, myself in the chat. You can send it to Trish as well in the chat, and we will relay it to one of our panelists. So um, I'll give it just a couple seconds, but if, if you're going to type it, I will also move to the next question as well. Well, I will ask that last question as maybe a few of our attendees might be typing away. And that question is, 
how does, and considering that a couple of you have recently or will move to new positions, thinking about like, where does that, your current position fit into your overall career story? Are you at where you want to be or what's next in your career? And this is really just to give an idea for those attending, like what is the progression of someone who would follow in your footsteps? And I'll start with Myra this time. Yeah, so um, it fits in exactly what I wanted within the field that I wanted to move into. Um, so, and the skills that I wanted to learn this time around is is essentially how to be part of a launch. Um, it is a key of building up your professional um, stack of tools. Um, and I am hoping that this will lead, you know, maybe not stay in this particular company for life forever, but uh, providing those extra skills so I can move up. Um, so my title will be medical science liaison, but there are also uh, senior MSLs, executive level MSLs. You can become a manager if you want to of an MSL team. You can actually go um, and work within the headquarters of the company in the, in the medical affairs type of uh, role. And again, there are many, many different roles within that, uh, whether it is US based or worldwide based, um, international based. So there is quite a lot of opportunity um, and having the ability uh, to be part of a launch is one of those key things that I wanted to have in order for those future steps to become a little bit more of a reality for me. Um, I am super excited about this new opportunity because it is in a space where there hasn't been any new products coming out in the last 50 years. And so the medical need is, is quite great. And so I, I know that I will continue to make an impact um, the way that I have been doing in the last couple of years. And so it's, it's, I'm just collecting the checks not like literally checks, but, you know, check marks, check marks. And there's also the check too. Um, so yeah, all is good. All is perfect. I, this is exactly where I wanted to be. This is exactly the kind of company, the kind of team that I look, that I was looking forward to. Um, and so I'm, I'm super, super excited. Thank you, Myra. Eleanor, why don't I call on you next? Uh, so I would say uh, SciTech is a young company, and I think they're still building out the structure of sort of how people are getting promoted within the company. So um, we're starting to get structure of senior application specialists, managers, a sort of management group. A lot of people go more into sales or sales management, or people are going into R&D, depending on sort of where their hearts are. Um, I have been surprised by how much I really enjoyed being a field application scientist. So I, I am hoping that being a manager in this company, I'm going to be garnering a lot more skills to, to support field applications and to mentor people. Um, I would also say that being a expert in a really in-demand technology is never a bad thing in the biomedical field. So. Thank you, and Andrew. I agree with that. Being an expert in in-demand technology <laughs> is the best thing. Um, but <laughs> on, on more on the side of the career path, um, I mentioned that when I was in grad school and a postdoc, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. And just an update on that, I still don't know what I want to do with my career. Um, and I think honestly, being a field application scientist is great for someone like me because you get such a broad exposure and get to develop such a wide range of skills. Um, my, my job is like split in fifths between working like on the R and D side, the engineering side, business development, marketing, and sales. And as I've been in this position more, I've started to narrow down a bit more of what I want in a career. And I think, you know, I'll get there in a year or two where I'm pretty confident I'm not going to be a field application scientist forever, but I think it's a really great position for me right now where I'm at. And I think it's a great position. It's, it's a great career decision to be an FAS 
because you can launch in so many different directions. And, you know, I might go down to business development route, marketing route. Um, but right now, all of the skills that I learn and utilize on a day-to-day -day basis are so broadly applicable to a whole range of different scientific careers that it's, it's just, uh, it's nice having just really unlimited opportunities in front of you. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens. Thank you all. With that, we'll end the recorded part of this session. And